Got plenty of seats. Make yourself comfortable. Grab uh, some of the treats that we have. So let me um, start with the introductions. Uh, your, this is part of the uh, joint uh, seminar series, um, our weekly series with the Natural Resource Ecology Lab, with the Ecosystem Science and Sustainability Department, and the uh, North Central Climate Science Center. And I, I, I play a role in each of those, and uh, because of that, they sort of asked me to sort of pull this together and, and host it. And, and because of our interest um, jointly across these communities, these institutions, is that climate change and looking at how we manage for climate change is really a, a core effort. And so we use that as the theme for the seminar and, and, and you know, really you know, asking Jeff and, and, and Benny in his arm, given his busy schedule, to really be part of this seminar series was really um, an integral part because of the work that he's been doing um, and you'll describe today um, in looking at monitoring um, changes in various landscapes, especially in dry lands, um, and sort of some things that we're also very much interested in, both in the academic and research area, is how we engage with various communities and managers and how we actually look at solutions from what we know about these ecosystem processes, these landscape dynamics. And with the arid land work that um, Jeff has been doing over the years, it's really incredible. Um, you know, he comes to us from the, um, the Agricultural Research Service at La Cruces. Um, he's with the USDA lab there. Um, but he also um, works, you know, at the university, Mexico State University there at Las Cruces, always um, also involved with the uh, LTER efforts. So he has a, a broad set of um, associations and affiliations. He's also been one of our lead delegates within the um, international team leading the, um, under the um, UN Convention of Combating Desertification. And he's been very much involved with that over the last three years, especially re-engaging and reinvigorating, I think, the whole effort in UNCCD. And so with that, he'll describe some of the uh, sort of research and monitoring efforts within that um, in his uh, presentation here on land potential knowledge systems, where we're really looking at sort of the sharing of information using modern technologies um, in those approaches. So thanks again, Jeff, for, for being here. I'm going to throw a question for Dennis that I should have asked a month ago. Um, I can time this presentation to end more or less whenever you want. So, you know, like 11.10, is that when you want to start with questions? <laughs> <laughs> if we had like 40 minutes or 35, 40 minutes, so we have about 50, 10, 15 minutes of discussion, that'd be great. Okay. Great, no, that's great. And, and I'd like to start just by introducing some folks to the back. We're actually having a project meeting today at the back of the room. Thanks very much for Keith for setting this up. So Luke Salzman is the software engineer on the project. You can raise your hand. Lena Bouvier is our lead from USAID and very heavily involved as a geographer in the technical aspects as well as overseeing the <coughs> incredible administration uh, that's required for any USAID project. Adam Bay is the global coordinator and uh, you may uh, recognize many of you since you graduated from CSU. Um, and uh, uh, then we may have somebody else walking through the door. Um, so before I jump into this, you, you mentioned sort of the work and outreach with land management agencies. And actually today we have some very exciting news um, from BLM has just released an instructional memo that now um, requires BLM and the field offices to conduct monitoring to assess the effectiveness of land use plans using the assessment inventory and monitoring system. Uh, this is, may not sound like a lot of instructional menus, memos are very kind of bureaucratic within the Bureau of Land Management, but basically what this says is that BLM now is required to use standardized <laughs> protocols that are also used by the Natural Resources Conservation Service for the Global Natural Resources Inventory, right? So we have these massive national standardized data sets with tens of thousands of plots, like about 50,000 plots right now. 
those same methods are now going to be applied on um, a sort of local and landscape scale, providing ecologists with an even more phenomenal resource to look at. And also, because AIM also has a, a, takes a standardized statistical approach to monitoring, as opposed to the kind of ad hoc that has been used in the past by the agencies, um, applying a lot more rigor. So this is something actually what I've worked on for the first 20 years of my career. Um, Jason Carl at the Hornada has, has been taking the lead for that the last five years or so. Um, but certainly something, if anybody's interested in public land management, I'm more than happy to talk about that with you afterwards. And as Dennis noted, I am now kind of in the area. My wife is at Neon. I'm still based in Las Cruces, New Mexico, but I get up to Boulder about a week a month. So um, anyway, some really exciting stuff going on. Um, I did want to highlight, this is, I think, the, the statement for the seminar that, that Dennis provided the seminar series. Um, certainly something that, that we're really excited about. I am now going to start with um, something, uh, a couple of more depressing. Um, this, how, how many people have actually gone out and read the inscription on this, on this statue? Okay, that's not the full poem. The full poem is here, right? But he's carrying a cat, maybe dead, maybe alive out of a snowstorm. But the weatherman said there was only 20% chance of flurries for that. So that's a very short-term context. Think of that in the context of, of longer-term climate change. Right? We can't control it. I mean, we're trying, right? Through all the work that Keith is doing, the mitigation and so forth. <clears throat> Here's another example. Popular. How many people know that the, this song, Dirt by Florida to Georgia Line. Country music? Not big here, okay. <laughs> uh, very popular, it's been on the airways for a long time, and, and it's a fascinating song because he basically talks about how much he loves red dirt. Right, he's talking about the red dirt roads, this is the southeast of the United States. And if you've ever driven through the United States, the southeast, you've seen the dirt roads, they're all red dirt. And what's worse is it's not just the road that's red dirt, it's everything to either side of the road for hundreds and hundreds of miles in the direction. That's the soil profile that used to be there when his grandfather, his dad damned his luck on it, because his grandfather let it all wash away. This is before no-till agriculture. What happens when you remove that top 15 centimeters of soil? You don't look at a 20% drop in precipitation. You look at a 98% drop in soil moisture if the majority of your storms come at more than one or two millimeters an hour, which is all that clay can absorb. That's the saturated infiltration capacity for that soil now And you saturate almost immediately on soil like that. Then it starts raining all of a sudden. You're on all right. So you got on a landscape like this, and how many photos have we see like this blaming climate change for that dead zebra? This one not, because I took it on a land degradation down. <laughs> all right. That is an argillic horizon that's been exposed at the surface and cemented. That's that. Okay. There's no grass here, not because of climate change, because of overgrazing, possibly some, this is close enough to Nairobi, Adam, that there might have actually been some cultivated agriculture there at some point, I don't know. Um, but basically the water just sheets off. So, I did come here to talk about climate change, and I just thought I had And this whole idea of land potential and how we can use the concept of land potential to avoid this kind of a situation. And this is actually a pedestal in Iceland. Okay, This is a landscape that sheep never should have been allowed on because we had sheep. This is this is taller than I am. I wish I couldn't I couldn't you know the selfie thing didn't quite work. Um, 
but it's it's literally that pedestal is taller than I am, and that's where that that was the original land surface. Um, fortunately, in the case of that, it's a deep volcanic soil, so it doesn't really matter. Infiltration rate didn't change at all for the lost all right soil. Organic matter did, but they can get that back. It's an incredibly resilient system. We haven't been to Iceland. It's it's fascinating. So land potential, um, in other words, what the land can sustainably do for us depends on relatively static soil properties, texture, mineralogy, depth, topography, and climate. This is a nice example from northern Namibia, contrast two soils right next to each other that are incredibly different in their um, capacity to support crop growth, and obviously in their carbon sequestration potential. Another example, this happens to be from England, <coughs> where the percent of the years when crops can be grown without irrigation, so this is in current climate conditions, without climate change, varies for spring barley from 80% to 5%. And these are soils that are literally intermixed with each other in Norfolk. For potatoes, the range isn't quite so much. On the other hand, you probably better not grow potatoes if you don't already have irrigation, unless climate change is predicted to increase precipitation in this area. I don't know, Illinois, what did, is, is England going to get more, more rain or, or less rain? More rain? Oh, good, but potatoes are in. Good. <laughs> All right, so, but having this understanding can help us then to target soil conservation and land restoration where it's going to have the greatest benefits for adaptation. So basically localizing and targeting our climate change investments based on this understanding of land potential. So here's a landscape in, in um, southern Mexico. Clearly, if we had a better understanding of land potential, we probably wouldn't have planted corn and cultivated on this part of the landscape to begin with. We've now again exposed that clay rich argillic horizon. Those corn plants have only barely become established as opposed to over in these areas where they're doing quite well because we've actually stripped off of that convex part of the landscape. We could use it today to identify those parts of the landscape where actually we probably can sustainably intensify crop production. Now granted, that's not a very large area, but I wouldn't be surprised, I'd love to go back to this area and actually do some measurements. We were just walking through it, obviously. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you couldn't grow more corn if you put all of your inputs and management into this area than they're currently growing on the entire whole slope. We can also use these concepts then to actually look at the whole land tenure system. In fact, USAID is now pulling our project together with some land tenure-based projects to better understand how to manage land where we're actually establishing tenure, but also our hope is in the future to help target those land tenure investments to those parts of the landscapes and those regionally where you can actually have a greater impact. So this is the problem, the, the ultimate problem here is one of land tenure. Okay, some good news. Um, most, a lot of folks have probably seen this graph before. Um, until the biofuel standard was enacted, because we really don't want to look what, what happens after 2007. But before the biofuel standard was, was enacted, um, erosion declined dramatically on those properties. And that had to do with new technology, no-till, and the implementation of that. It also had to do with um, uh, the um, various tools in the farm bill based on incredibly crude I mean, these aren't even models. These are, these are just basically <coughs> saying that you can't do certain things on highly erodible land. And highly erodible land was defined with an incredibly crude metric, okay? From a scientific perspective, everybody hates it. Even most of the managers in NRCS hate it, okay? Because it's based on T. It's based on this you know, erosion tolerance that nobody believes. But from a policy perspective, this is what it helped us do. It helped us identify those lands that you really shouldn't be cultivating, or if you're going to, you've got to use some kind of conservation technology versus those that you don't. Again, we can't attribute this whole decline to matching land use to land potential, but quite a bit of it. Okay, a paper, um, Eleanor Mellon sitting in the back of the room, uh, recently led with a number of co-authors, including many from here, uh, looking at 
sort of grazing lands and climate change mitigation uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, but a lot of the same lessons we recently participated in a workshop hosted by TNC in Boulder a couple of months ago that same, came to very much the same conclusions. Um, basically, you shouldn't be managing just for carbon sequestration. You really need to be managing for ecosystem services where increases in carbon actually provide more co-benefits. And, and Keith is, is uh, leading this project. Um, so you can think in terms of from a climatic perspective, where should we be focusing these efforts? Probably not in the Sahel. Um, but also then, um, again, going back to this slide. So this is actually what the local knowledge says. This is land that will be cropped. Here's your deep loamy soil. In the first year, no manure is needed, and even during dry years, it will make it. Okay, so from from both an adaptation and a mitigation perspective, um, you know, here are the areas we need to be managing. However, this is these light soils, and Greg Oaken at UCLA has a, a next door project in Botswana where he's been looking at vulnerability of these linear dunes to um, uh, basically uh, re-destabilization as a result of cultivation. Okay, so, we can look at this from sort of an adaptation mitigation, these soils, and then these from a vulnerability perspective. And again, these, these soils are intermixed in these landscapes at such a fine scale that you'll never pick them up with a soil map, and even the digital soil maps. And we've actually got a, a Michaela Wenneman uh, has been working with us on the land PKS and doing some evaluations in this part of Namibia, uh, looking at different soil maps and how they've been applied and their accuracy relative to the, the Potential knowledge system inputs for mobile apps, um, and, and in fact, confirming that you really you, you cannot pull these out, you really have to go to the field. So, managing sort of at multiple scales with knowledge and information at the appropriate scale. So, take home number two mitigation we can use this to focus climate change mitigation on those areas with the greatest potential rates of persistent carbon sequestration. And, um, I know, again, this is a great building to be in because a lot of people have done huge amounts of work on this. Um, so the question then, how do we save our soil and all of our soil? It's biodiversity, address climate change. Um, pronouncements, we're really good at that. Policies can help as we showed with that slide. And what we're really focusing on with this project and what we'll spend the rest of the time talking about is connecting people and knowledge using technology. <laughs> So as a, a workshop participant in Northern Namibia said, uh, we need to decide, we need to see beyond what we see so we can decide what to do next. Um, and basically to be able to figure out how to manage these landscapes based on the soils. And in fact, if we want to do an agroforestry system, then maybe we should be looking even more finely at the bottom of the lands. We also need the ability to be able to share relevant knowledge and information globally. So these are two soils in on the Hornada, actually, in southern New Mexico, where I work, and in Kunani, Namibia, northwestern Namibia. Um, not only do they have the same physical and chemical properties, they actually smell the same. So when I camp out in these landscapes and I wake up in the middle of the night, I think, oh, yeah, 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 back in the truck and drive back to Las Cruces. And then I look around and realize, no, I'm actually not in New Mexico anymore. I mean, it's, 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 it's stunning, you know, and, and think about land potential from a biodiversity perspective, soil biodiversity. And, and I, I can't wait for Diana to do some sort of a, a comparison between these two areas um, and then just see, you know, is it just, is it, you know, what is it about the functional groups that are, are generated? Um, okay, so the land potential knowledge system, which is what we're trying to develop, it's a system for collecting, storing, accessing, and sharing. That's a lot of different things. And, and Rick, uh, the software engineer in the back, is always giving me a hard time for uh, my high expectations. Um, of what technology can do and how quickly it can do it. But this is the, the path that we're on. Uh, 
and, and then selecting and interpreting the relative knowledge and information. You know, right now you do a Google search. So my wife and I bought um, a passive solar Adobe house in southern New Mexico because so that would be really an eco cool idea. Right? It just happened to be on two and a half acres of irrigated pecans. <laughs> I'm a rangeland soil scientist. I don't know nothing about the cons, but I have a computer and I have Google. I am still, still encountering knowledge and information that I should have been able to get instantly for my soil for my water availability, which happens to be flood as supplemented by well, and my water quality. I should have had that at my fingertips. We have the ability. If, if I was trying to buy a new car or a new pickup truck, I would have that information of my, you know, I, I, I researched for a new computer about a month ago. And I was able to go to all the shopping websites and they told me exactly what I needed based on my, um, my taste in, um, you know, uh, chicken McNuggets. You know, I could, based on the choice of chicken McNuggets, gonna pick out and tell me what kind of computer I need. Okay, not quite, but almost. You go on Amazon's website and we should be able to do that for land. Um, so how are we going to do this? We can't do it just with a single USAID project standing alone. We're doing this by partnering with organizations all over the world. And so we've actually sort of transformed this land potential knowledge system project into a global partnership where we're working with a, a large number of organizations, and this is just actually a subset of the ones that are most actively involved on the technology development side. And now I, we need to add CSU and the, and the Carbon Benefits Project um, to this. Um, and then also on the adoption and implementation side. So how does it work? I'm gonna spend uh, several minutes walking you through uh, this flow chart. So basically, we've got our mobile apps, and with those mobile apps, we can crowdsource a certain amount of information. We get location right away. We can use the camera, so we've actually got a group of of CU um, students, uh, computer science students, worked on their senior project and developed a Silicon Color app, which is not quite ready for prime time, but we're working on that. And we'll probably have another group of CU students coming in, uh, working with us on, on that. Um, we can also ask them to provide some basic soil information through the app, the description that we lead them through with some guided videos and so forth. And with that information, we can use algorithms to identify the most likely soil profile. So rather than just pointing to a soil map and saying, oh yeah, the dominant soil map in the component. So how many people have used soil maps? Okay. Are they any good? <laughs> Depends, yeah. Okay, but how often, if you dig a hole and, and, and basically look for the soil that the soil map says is the most likely soil to occur on that location, how often do you find it? Half the time, typically. Right? Know, it depends on what kind of landscape you're in. If you're out in the middle of Death Valley at, uh, at, at Burning Man, um, you'll hit the same soil every single time, except where they double the tree. <laughs> oh, that's supposed to do that. Um, <laughs> All right, so, but most places you're gonna find very soil. So we'd like to know exactly from a small, from, from a, you know, from a modeling perspective, maybe it doesn't matter, from a, a global soil prediction perspective, it doesn't matter, but from a small farmer perspective, they really do need to know which list of soil. Okay, so we, we run this set of, uh, and this is actually, uh, this has not been developed yet, so we've developed this stuff. Um, we've got prototypes for this that we're currently starting to test. Based on the location, we can get our climate. And then start to run the kinds of models that are, are, are used here. And again, uh, collaborating with the ASA uh, in Vienna, predict the potential productivity and degradation risk under various management scenarios using models, and then eventually crowdsourcing that local knowledge to come back in. So, um, you know, we'll go back to them and we have the ability through the apps to, to you know, as, as long as they're willing to take the notifications, right? Come back with the notification 12 months from now and say, hey, did you see any well? Did you see any erosion? What were your yields? How much nitrogen did you use? And so forth. And then we can incentivize them either with additional information. You get to compare your yields to your neighbor's yields, but you can't do that until you put your yields in. Right? None of us are competitive in this room, right? <laughs> um, or, you know, in, in some cases, and actually developing countries like Kenya actually have a better system for, for 
for paying people small amounts of money very easily through the app um, than we do in the United States. It's actually quite, quite simple through a pace, et cetera. Um, and then we can connect based on their, their management objectives and the conditions to some management options. Okay, so rather than just getting what I got when we put our, our pecan orchard in and I, I asked the local extension person to come out and said, well, I said, well, what do you think I should do? Well, we're promoting drip irrigation. <laughs> and I don't know much, but I did get a PhD in applied soil physics and I looked at my soil profile and I thought, okay, we're not doing drip irrigation. It just didn't make sense, that's what we're about. But, you know, he hadn't dug a hole, he didn't have time, you know, if I'd had an app, and then I could go and talk with him about all the information. So this is a replacing extension. It's basically providing an opportunity for people to engage or substitute an extension, an extension to go out with all the available knowledge and information, rather than just whatever they happen to see when they're there. So, um, so we really see this as a, a big opportunity for extension as well. And then also then to feed back in, if somebody has a really innovative management system and technique, then, then they, can, they can provide that. So how does it work? Super simple apps available now on Android, land info and land cover. Um, as long as you don't have a PhD, you will have no problem running these at all. <laughs> Your PhD will get stuck on the first screen, I can you. <laughs> um, and, and I mean, honestly, this is the experience that we've had. Right? I don't, I mean, there's, 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 and you can talk about it. You know, we go out with a, with, with, with a driver who grew up herding cattle and they just kind of came their way through it. Um, the NRCS state range column for um, Arizona, who is obviously has a degree in natural resource management, but just whizzed through this thing even almost faster than I can the first time through it. Um, but if you start asking too many questions about why they do this and why they do that and why you're not allowed to do that, then yeah, you're not going to get a report. Um, it will be available very, 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 very soon on iOS, Rick. You want, to, you want to give us a date? Uh, next week. No, well, that's when it goes to Apple. When's Apple going to get back on us? Uh, then that's what they care about. Three weeks after that. Okay, so a month. But that's presumably really? when Apple actually tells us if they care. Okay. Two months. Not a good yeah, this is the way these conversations work. <laughs> okay, um, all right, so Land Info, there's two apps. Uh, currently provides the ability to easily collect and cloud store basic soil info. So if you're just going out, and we've actually used this on the Hornada to do site selection and, and basically making sure that our controls and treatments are matched. It's really actually quite effective for that. Um, it does provide you also with the ability if you're driving around the countryside someplace you've never been before, one click access to, um, uh, actually I'll just show here, to your climate. So there's your precipitation and there's your temperature if you have access to so the internet. Um, it's actually kind of nice, even if you're just, I use it, um, never, of course, when I'm driving, but when I'm going back and forth through the Colorado and Mexico, just to kind of go look at the vegetation, I go, ah, it looks like we got more precip here, and it'll actually give you the, you know, the base to some precepts. And you plan available water holding capacity based on your soil inputs. The future inversions obviously will include all the fun things that we talked about earlier. Um, the inputs, it's all icon based, um, as simple as possible. We do give you numbers, but, but when you're describing what the uh, Course fragment content, rock content of your soil is, is in percentages. The slope, um, you can use the icons or you can actually use the chronometer that's built in there. Um, again, the PhD factor comes in and screws that up. Um, the output, you get the one click access to, to this information. There's another app, land cover app. Um, anybody knows Karina Reginos? Um, so Karina and I work together on, on developing a, a protocol that's applied in East Africa but equally relevant here, um, where you can basically collect that AIM NRI sort of standard methods that I talked about earlier that, that BLM is now going to on their NORAP. These methods are, the, the data are perfectly compatible with those. Okay, much simpler system, it's not going to use much detail, we're not getting into the species level, these are individual icons or cover classes. Right, but it's a point intercept method based on five points. <laughs> you measure height using that same stick that has marks of 10, 30, 50, 70, 90 centimeters. We measure, determine the spatial structure, whether or not there are gaps, which we then use to drive wind erosion models, and then if you want to record species density. And again, you know, something that can be downloaded now and, and uh, reuse. Uh, the data portal, you can go to the portal, and as soon as you come in, you don't need data connectivity to use the apps. As soon as you come back into an area where you have connectivity, 
it automatically uploads your plot, and your mother can see what you've been doing in the movie. <laughs> Literally, and then you can get on the data for them and say, oh yeah, you know, they said they were out in the field working um, when they didn't answer my phone today, but clearly they weren't doing anything. <laughs> Why didn't you call me? Um, okay, uh, and then we're starting to work on data visualizations. Um, so, Edmundo Barrios, a colleague of, of Diana's and, and mine in, uh, at, uh, at ICRA, um, has been doing a lot of work on sort of uh, local indicators of, of soil quality and soil health um, and communication. And I, there have been a lot of interesting articles recently on citizen science. Um, but, but, you know, talking more about not just how can we get them to do our work for us, but also how do we engage them uh, constructively. So crowdsourcing, um, beyond crowdsourcing for science. Um, so this is really kind of a, a big part of our vision, open source, open data, citizen science. Um, there are a lot of very similar efforts to what we're doing, um, being driven entirely behind walls um, by John Deere, by Monsanto. The precision agriculture movement is basically trying to do what we're doing as well, which is localize your predictions of everything from water, localized predictions, et cetera, kind of your management. Okay, um, that is not open. So we are basically creating an open platform together with our, our partners. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Adam. Yeah, well, uh, you know, we're sitting in this, this room here and I uh, see a few about the greens in the room. We also, we, we spent a lot of time with audiences like this, and then more, much, much smaller and we get we get pretty geeked out talking about how we can tweak our predictive models this way or another way, what our analytic system looks like. You know, it's, it's all well and good, but, but really, ultimately, nothing is really worth anything if we can't insert ourselves into the classic Chinese slip box of Khadija here in the foreground, who this is in the Arica region of Tanzania. And, you know, if, if what is coming through on that, phone screen is not of any use or cannot be digested by people who are actually roaming around this landscape and giving them something useful for them to improve their livelihoods um, while also you know, paying attention to the sustainability of this landscape at the time. Uh, we're not we're not really we're missing the book completely. And you know so we we're we're in a constant battle trying to to balance, balance those two things. You know, we have a, a funding stream, a funding mechanism that is uh, heavily focused on development and not uh, on implementation. So we have to look at very uh, creative and innovative ways of reaching out to extension agencies in uh, these parts of the world that have these relationships with real people on the ground who have quite a bit of uh, real and perceived risk associated with adopting some of these technologies. Uh, we take very seriously the interface on to itself. Uh, we labor a great deal over the imagery and iconic icons that we have on, on the uh, on the phone. You might look at it and think it's pretty simple, but there have been multiple multiple iterations of feedback in the field to try and get 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 that piece right. All well, the science can happen on the back end. Of the world. You can set up the on how we intend this and live on the back, um, but we need to. We try very hard to get constant iterative feedback on this work. Um, so, I mean, I think as as you know, when Dennis makes the the uh, introduction to Jeff here and talking about providing legitimate tools, useful tools to folks on the ground, this is what I think about that. Uh, it doesn't really matter much unless we do something useful. No, thanks. That's perfect. And that's really, I mean, in terms of, you know, I've talked a lot about partnering, and we are equally interested in partnering with folks who are interested in working with us on the technology side. So, Keith Street, as we are in working with people who are interested in figuring out how this works. So, there's a professor at, at um, CU that, in anthropology, that just got a, a C grant to go and basically look at technology implementation and adoption using an NPDES as an example, as a research project in um, northern Tanzania in the border with 
with Kenya. And, and we would welcome um, the opportunity to work with anyone. Again, we're not, the, the way our partnerships are working is we just, we, we basically um, <coughs> share resources without sharing. <coughs> and the reason we do that is basically to keep it simple. And so if you want to work with us and you don't have funding, we will write whatever letters, we'll help you write your grant proposal, we'll do whatever we need to do to help you get that funding um, so that we can then uh, work together. And, um, or if you've already got funding, you're already doing something where it would help to be able to use some of these tools, we'll help you gain access, and to the extent possible, as we're gonna be doing with, with Keys Group, um, we'll actually work on tweaking what we're doing through the APIs and so forth to make sure that, that, that they can go with it. And so there's some, some real opportunities um, but not just on the technology development, the, 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 the science side. And then also from a calibration perspective, I mean, there are, especially if you go to the data port now, you can download all the data. There are phenomenal opportunities now for masters and, and PhDs just using the data that are starting to stream. Um, as, as people start to sort of generate this and crowdsource and perspective, the data and the mix and so forth. Um, we've got, um, and if you'd like to become more directly engaged, we do have uh, uh, basically two groups, one based at CSU at the Sustainability Innovation Lab at CU that Jason Neff has been standing up, uh, Future Earth, the, the second half of Future Earth, half of it's based here, half of it's based there, I guess, as I understand it, and then it's much better than I do. Um, but anyway, they're based in the same building. They're, they're with us, where our group is going to be. We'll have um, three postdocs in the program are based there, another postdoc and a number of graduate students based at Mexico State University. Um, so lots of opportunities and I think the, the meetings over the last couple of days of Keith's group is sort of open up and then of course walking down the hallway and, and seeing all of you there in the hall, hall base has reminded me that you know this this can very much I think um, expand uh, you know, to a lot of collaboration with CSO as well. We're, we're not interested in, in running a project, we're interested in building um, and with that, I'll just end with, with some resources uh, if you're interested in, in, in learning more. Um, obviously, you can read my editorial about my biases. Um, I think climate change is incredibly important. I also think that we've been missing the boat on some, some things because we've been ignoring what's already happened. Um, this is a report, uh, the International Resource Panel, which is kind of like an IPCC, but for sustainability issues run out of UNEP. Uh, just published, and basically, if you're interested in these issues, this is kind of a primer on land evaluation, and it goes through a lot of kind of the basics that, that I talked about in the first few slides. Um, it's it's a relatively short report; it's about 89 pages, um, and there's actually a policy or something. I actually brought a couple of cop well, just one copy, unfortunately, which I can't leave. Um, it's been translated into Chinese. I think we're going to try to get it translated into to Spanish as well. Um, this talk was actually sort of loosely based on an article that was published in the ESA's New Journal, Income System Health and Sustainability, um, similar to the other talk. Um, another a book chapter that Adam and I worked on together, sort of looking at some more of the social aspects um, that, that, that Adam's talked about, and, and actually looking at conflict and a little bit and how we can use these kinds of tools, not only to increase food security, but also to reduce conflict in these areas. Um, and then, of course, the website itself and potential better work. Um, so with that, I'll close for awesome. Thanks. Yeah, this is really exciting advancements. And, you know, I think in, in thinking about our Climate Science Center and the work that we do with resource managers across, you know, areas of the United States, especially in our semi-arid areas that we, our domain is, I could see, you know, our researchers and some of the managers actually kind of using this tool and, you know, land, soil conditions, being able to incorporate into our databases that as we look at both land use and climate change effects. So it's, it's pretty exciting. It's really come a long way. I'm sure there's plenty of questions, though. This is the first one with the answers. Uh, do, do you include ranching and, and the management options, or is it mostly agricultural planting? Yeah, so um, our, our initial focus in developing the proposal was on guiding land use change because that's where your big decision makers are. And, and basically, with all the work and travel I've done in 
Asia, Latin America, and Africa just being horrified at which pieces of land are being converted and which aren't. Um, and so that's that's sort of the, the, the big, you know, sort of short-term impact we'd like to have and a relatively easy one, actually, in terms of the model and so forth. Um, we are very interested, it's already being used, actually, in pastoral systems in Kenya. In fact, we've got graduate students writing up right now who basically use it to um, you, uh, basically look at uh, restoration treatments on range sites and, and basically comparing those from a sort of apples to apples, as opposed to apples to oranges perspective on similar soils. So using it for the selection of, a, of um, non randomized controls for, 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 for treatments. As far as the management side goes, we are also working with NRCS now. So this is really kind of an interesting project. We, 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 we walk a very fine line, but so far actually it's been a, a big wide street because there's been so much sort of positive synergy going back and forth from the domestic side and the international side. Our, our hard dollar funding is almost exclusively with small exception from NRCS right now from USAID. So it's an international development project. NRCS though, is extremely interested in this. And they're providing a lot of in-kind support, uh, technical support, to that soil identification piece because they ultimately want to link it to ecological site descriptions. How many people are familiar with ESDs? Okay, so ecological site descriptions are basically um, <coughs> descriptions of uh, the dynamics, ecological dynamics and responses to management for similar groups of soils in regions and now expand to, to the rates of the United States. Um, one of the problems we've had with this in the past is that these the, the state and transition models, so the conceptual model that define the, the threshold and non-threshold transitions for a particular piece of land, have been developed by either one or a small group of people and may be subject to some peer review. The reality, though, is that there's a huge amount of local knowledge about the dynamics of these pieces of land that NRCS would love to be able to integrate this process. They have no way to do that at this time. So there's a, a funding proposal that's kind of actually an internal one that's working its way through NRCS right now that would provide significant additional support that would in fact turn this into a crowdsourcing tool for the development of STM models as well as the delivery of them. And I should have said that backwards, the delivery of STM models, but also for, for ranchers and others to be able to provide their feedback uh, to that. So we had a nice conversation with Richard Teague and some other folks about how we can start to use so, um, this might be for Adam, I'm not sure, but you talked about trying to get people to actually use these and just use the information at the, at the end. To what extent do you have local knowledge in the front end, both in terms of what kind of data you're collecting, but also management questions that you're asking? Yeah, well, the, the local knowledge that we're pulling in right now, those that is simply by the applications that we, we are asking. What is your local want to do when you next? You know, a, a richer narrative about what happens on this landscape over time and what has happened over time. That is really that, that photograph that was that was up there. Where we're in the ring out with the folks that are on this landscape, that's that's where that iterative process is coming in. And so we don't yet have a an automated system that we can pull in that type of information. And so what we're doing right now is trying to have as many of these sorts of relationships or exposure to these two groups of folks to try and pull that in and bring it back to the design. So we rely quite a bit on folks like NRT, um, the uh, implementers in Kenya, which like that, that uh, Jeff was talking about, like you know, menstruation treatments. Uh, you know, it doesn't it doesn't happen without that close communication with the So we have to rely on real humans right now, actually talking to each other and bringing that information back to what people can do. Um, and we're that is going to help us to figure out some way to help. So we we rely a lot on extension. 
and that's, I mean, the reality is, if you read the, so the first article we wrote in, on this, the Journal of Water Conservation, I didn't mention, in 13, I think, laid out this grand vision that really had this sort of interactive, iterative sort of interaction, all everything on your phone. Okay. And, and, and we'll get there. I mean, the next 10 years, I think if we don't, somebody else will. It's going to happen. Um, the reality is right now, given the complexities of coding, and particularly with a mobile phone, a lot of that sort of feedback and interaction we're talking about is going to have to occur mediated by extension or the which you know, three years or whatever. Um, or through a web-based interface, which again means probably you know, on, a, on a larger screen mediated by somebody else. It's just, it's, um, Rick has it's spent a lot of time reminding me about how complicated um, it is to implement all of the great ideas that I want to try. <laughs> Mind you, that we need more participation. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like the, the quality of the outputs must depend to some degree, and must vary quite a bit, and depend on some combination of calibration and the density of inputs. Yeah. So, the question is two parts. First of all, um, are there thresholds of inputs that you need to reach before the outputs are useful? And and secondarily, how do you communicate uncertainty to the users? Those are two really good questions. And actually, we're having a workshop with the new sort of group of postdocs next week. If you want to come out to Nun, Colorado, and ask them those questions. <laughs> <laughs> because I, no, I, it's something we've been thinking about and talking about. There's a fair bit of literature on that. Um, none of the literature sort of points to any ideal solution. And that there are really no answers. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, you have a follow up? Yeah. Um, I'm curious if you've asked any questions of different communities about why people change their land use and the different constraints and options that they have available to them, why they decide to cultivate in one place versus another. Um, you know, they may be driven by other factors other than the soil quality and the potential um, productivity. Right, so we haven't done that research. Obviously we do it anecdotally every time we go to the field. Um, and certainly, yeah, it very much depends on sort of where you are. So in the case of Northern Namibia, actually, there is A, enough flexibility because they're combining farming with ranching and we'll use about 10% of the landscape anyway for farming and um, enough local knowledge that they know to grow their corn. Now, if you look at a satellite image, you can see that there, you know, somebody didn't figure that out because they've cleared these squares out of the sand and then abandoned them. You can see that. For the most part, they figured it out. Now flip to the um, alluvial plains um, in Kenya, coming down from Mount Kenya, where they've been moving people out of the forest and basically giving these plots of land on an alluvial plain. And this is an alluvial plain on a big mountain. So you can imagine what's on it. You know, there's a stream of gravel and sand and then some loam and then some clay and some gravel and sand. And they're literally putting these strips and you can fly over this. If you were fly, those of you working in Africa from, from Nairobi to Nanyuki, you'll see what kind of you go, oh, well, that guy looked out. <laughs> and, you know, right? So in, in that case, to land tenure, the government itself, it, it's, it's, so yes, we're sensitive to those. We're not doing that research. We'd love it if somebody would take advantage of our systems and start to do something. Okay, sorry, Paul, you had a question. I did. Sorry. Um, so, are people learning from Nunavut? Is there people learning from each other in different parts of the world as a result of any of this work? Not yet, but that is exactly the idea. I mean, I, I am, I am so waiting for the moment that somebody in New Mexico looks at a dot in Namibia and goes, "I need to talk." And, and then we are going to create this, the, the, the ability for them to connect with, you know, with the uh, mutual buy-in, but basically an opt-in for my kind of address these questions. You mentioned this before in another talk, and I was just thinking about, you've been working with some of your groups, whether they're in New Mexico or wherever, to get this feedback. How long has that been working? Since you started this, you've had these teams of people to give you the feedback. 
Right, you know, anecdotally, I, to be honest, I would say the first mobile app that we developed is called Dima, which is the database for inventory monitoring and assessment. This is the one that DLM uses. It's an access-based database that we ran on tablets. And we started doing that um, back in the days before the iPad, when people said, you need to be using PDAs, you're wasting your time. So that was about 15 years ago. And we've been basically getting feedback from, you know, not as wide a range of users as we are now, but it was similar, you know, types of soil vegetation information. And, and that, that experience of working with DEMA for the last 15 years has very much informed and helped us avoid a lot of mistakes. And so are there, are there some of the same people in Namibia and Tanzania and Mexico that are now spreading the word about yeah. getting more crowd yeah, and that's and again we haven't promoted it a lot until now, partly because of the fact it wasn't on iOS. You know, we started on Android because we wanted to get up and running quickly. Now with iOS coming out, we expect that. So, yeah, Jeff, in our, um, when we were talking on Wednesday about this, one of the things that got me really interested in this, especially, was when you started talking about the different modules and extensions that you're starting to develop through some of your collaborations, and some of the people in the group. Other people here might be interested in hearing about some of that. Yeah, and it looks like I went a little too fast last night <laughs> and deleted that slide. So um, the next thing, <laughs> I was more interested in this one, actually. So I was like, yeah, so um, we actually have support now to develop uh, 3D maps. Um, one is a, a crop monitor app, which will provide that sort of input output. Um, on, on your management system, you know, very basic for this, you know, we'd like to get something out this coming year, and it'll be pretty simple. It's not going to allow you to, you know, define all of the same different forms of nitrogen you might put on your soil, but, but yeah, we're going to do the best we can um, with that. And then secondly, a biomass app, and this was actually, again, idea of somebody who had developed a paper version of this in Namibia, together with a huge database of somebody at AM. and So basically what it's gonna be is, um, it's a database of photos, or photo, what do you want to call it, photos, um, of plots, one meter square plots, half meter square plots, I think, um, where all the vegetation was subsequently clipped and weighed. And we're gonna create a photo key on the phone so that people don't actually, you know, anybody that's done double sampling with, um, with production, now we've done double sampling, NRCS is standard method, and not so many. Anyway, basically what you do is you estimate weight units, and then you clip those weight units, you weigh them, and then um, you do ocular estimates that calibrate it. You're basically, it's, it's, an, it's an ocular calibration system. So we're going to build that ocular calibration system into the phone for people that don't have time to clip and weigh and dry the bottom mass. Okay, and basically we'll go through this photo key. Um, to do that. Now, there are a lot of other people out there, and again, we're, you know, through the APIs, we'll eventually look into this, who are, are taking photos and getting biomass estimates through you know, image analysis and so forth. None of that has, has reached its potential, um, and, and we're going to hold off on that. We're going to get some of that. The third one is a body condition score, which again will be a, not a photo, but a, a, a line drawing, supplement one of our photos at our mobile phone. So for people that want to monitor the condition of their livestock, again, just clicking uh, the body condition score is a standard one to five or one to ten system where you evaluate the condition of your livestock and you basically just click the numbers mm -hmm. and the average body condition score. We'll then be able to relate that to the land cover app info. Again, once they get back onto the computer and eventually put it on the phones, um, to, to basically be able to show people, you know. This is what happens to your livestock two months later when you're eligible to Just to add something on that too, um, <coughs> we, we've started to scan up uh, some of our application prototypes, next to the number of biggest, um, where you folks can feed in, you can provide feedback on the design and development of any of those models. That's something that you and I have done. For folks in this room who might be interested in contributing to that design um, of any of those applications, including our existing one, um, just get in touch and give you one way to get into that service.
And this really is absolutely, key. I'm just a dumb scientist. I mean, it, it's Adam's interaction with people around the world and in this room that are really, that's why we've got as far as we have. Well, Jeff, I want to just thank you again. And actually, the opportunity of being your team and having them contribute to the seminar was really a fortunate opportunity. Um, and so let's, let's thank Jeff. Being here and just having this uh, opportunity of having this meeting uh, being co hosted here this past week. Um, next week, we have Lori Peak um, coming to speak to us. Uh, she'll be talking more on some of the social dimensions of equity and under, underrepresented um, um, communities and how their vulnerabilities will be affected by climate change and how she's been looking at sort of risk analysis and vulnerability with various communities around the world. So I think we'll sort of change gears a little bit, but I think you'll find it very uh, informative and uh, next week as well. So thanks again. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Good, how are you doing? Good. 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 Good